it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alice Fan, who's an assistant professor of oncology and a colleague of mine in our medical oncology division. Alice um, came to Stanford. She did her medical oncology training here at Stanford, and we were, again, fortunate to have Alice be interested in kidney cancer research, and she's now part of our clinical faculty. Alice spends uh, a big part of her time in her lab looking at how best to uh, study kidney cancer and the various drugs that we use. So I think one of the questions were about how can we um, detect from our tumor cells which therapy is right for a given patient. So Alice is going to tell us about her work and how the technology that she's developed in order to be able to get some answers from very little uh, tissue. So again, pleasure to uh, introduce Alice. Thanks for coming on a Saturday afternoon and sharing your work with us. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me. And it's so great to see everybody here. So it's my great pleasure to tell you today about a burning question in my mind and in many of your minds. How do we actually know if a treatment's working? We've heard a lot this morning about how can we predict from a biopsy, from our surgical specimen, from a drop of blood, how can we predict how long we're going to survive from our cancer or if it's likely to come back? But I'm gonna ask a, another how important complementary question, which is once we've actually chosen our, our therapy based on the best back. predictors, how do but I I'm actually know it's working? A, another important complementary question, which is once So we need better answers at every step for kidney tumors. And you've heard a lot how here about how we diagnose what, with um, Sunny's talk this so morning. We need better answers and every step how we can do surgery and how that's important. And a bit about choosing our first treatment. Well, for our patients and for many of you in the audience with advanced or metastatic cancer, and we know that this is a tough decision. We have a menu of well, treatments, and then we choose something, the and then it, try, it tries cancer. to do something against the we cancer know that this cells. Is a tough decision. And then we only a menu of 8 to 12 weeks we later, and you're tired of hearing this from me and Sandy, how long do we have to wait before we can see if it's working? Cells. We have and to do a CT scan, but we have to wait 8 to 12 weeks. Later, and you're tired of That's when we measure the clinical response, and eventually we'll know if we've cured or relapsed. So just to go over, to recap some of the things that we've talked about earlier, and then to launch into what I'm going to focus on, on. We know that at diagnosis, so you undergo go a standard evaluation, and that's determining your stage with CTs, imaging, in some cases an MRI, bone scan to see if it's gone to the bone. And, that's determining your stage and then CTs, if it's advanced disease imaging, and you require systemic cases, treatment MRI, while you would see the medical oncologist, me or Sandy, then we choose for you and the then, best systemic treatment we can based on all the information that we have. In some cases, it's now increasingly involving additional tests that we get. But um, it's important to think, OK, well, what are these treatments that are the first ones? And Sumit just gave you a very beautiful but, um, overview of especially nivolumab, one of the newest ones. But oh, this is an old slide. It's supposed to be systemic and therapy in 2016. And um, but you know it's important? Because in 2014, all we had were the ones in black. And in in the past year, the three that I've added are and, the three in blue. Um, but you know, it's in, so if you think about it, we've heard a lot today about immunotherapy, thanks the to the fantastic year, the talk that before me, and you heard about nivolumab so on Updevo being it, the newest we've heard a lot today um, immunotherapy that we have. The and we also, he, um, we also talked about, about mTOR inhibitors. These are inhibitors, Toracel and Infinidor, that are pills or given IV treatments that actually suppress tumor cell growth and survival signals in those cells. But if you look at this list, by far, the biggest category are pills and IV treatments treatments that are inhibitors of blood vessel formation. And again, this is really important because even the last two that have been approved, cabozantinib and linvatinib, um, these are inhibitors of blood vessel formation. And again, this is really important because even the last two that have been approved, So how do we know that, I just talked about all these targets that we're trying to do with all these specialized therapies. How do we know that this targeted therapy is working on my tumor or your tumor? I just talked about all these targets that we're trying to do with all these specialized therapies. How do we know that this targeted therapy is working on my tumor or your tumor? We really want to know what specialized therapies are happening in those cells. So from the time of first treatment, we know that we're supposed to be inhibiting the blood vessel formation we that really feeds the tumor cells if we give you one of those cells. seven. So the time of first or if we're giving you nivolumab, we, we think that we're, supposed we're supposed to be activating the immune system. But how are we measuring that? Right now, seven. the standard of care or is our CT scan, and these are diameter system. measurements. The problem with diameter measurements, that? even though that's right our gold standard, this is the best we've got right now, but it's billions and billions of cells in every square millimeter of tumor. We think we're trying to hit cells and immune cells that are going in there or hit blood vessels that are in the tumor. 
tumor cells, but we don't have ways of measuring those yet. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Again, the standard reevaluation scan is measuring the size of tumors and how that's changed. But this is what we're going to be talking about. Again, the standard the size of tumors and how that's changed. But this is Again, why for kidney cancer, that's not always the best way, and we're looking for better ways. So we know that a lot of our but treatments don't necessarily shrink your tumors. Not for a tumor to shrink, way, there has to be a change ways. in balance. Either so the tumor cells are dying faster than they're growing, or they've tumor. all stopped for growing and it's just not getting bigger. For it to actually shrink, something has to change in the balance. So just a diameter measurement of how big it is isn't telling us as much information as we really want to know for you. So just and the other hard part is that it does take 8 to 12 weeks for a treatment to actually halt tumor really growth. So by the time we can you. see it, based on a measurement the other hard part is with that a ruler, um, we've had to treat you and you've had to have all the side effects for 8 to 12 so weeks we before we can actually it, make that standard a measurement. With a ruler, and to make things even tougher, um, we know that with nivolumab, you just heard that there's a small percent of tumors that actually look bigger at the first scan. And how can we figure tougher, out if that that's bigger one that's, that's, that's going to shrink later because it's due to tumor cell infiltration with immune cells that are actually attacking the tumor cells, how can we or if it's actually if progression? That's bigger one that's so we have a lot of work to do to try and get better ways to figure this out. And so I'm going to tell you about what we're doing at Stanford as well as beyond. So we have a lot of work to do to try and get better ways to figure this out. So a more direct be let's measure not only the size and how things are changing based on a ruler measurement, but let's quantify how active so the cancer pathways are in your tumor. If we think we're knocking down these activity pathways, let's see if we can prove that in you, and let's try and do it sooner than the eight to 12 weeks. Are in your tumor. If we think we're knocking so down I'm going to spend um, quite a bit of time talking about the seven out of 10 targeted agents that actually suppress, suppress growth of blood vessels that feed the kidney tumors. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about so these are the seven listed here, Votrin, Sutent, Nexavar, Avastin, and Lyda, and the two newest ones, Cabometics and Lenvima. And these suppress the growth of blood vessels that feed the kidney tumor. So you can imagine if you've got a tumor, and imagine the tumor mass is in green and some normal tissue near it. And if you've got um, normal tissue near it, the tumor mass, in order to keep growing bigger and bigger, it needs to get oxygen and blood. So you've got to have growth of blood vessels that go into the, the into the tumor in and feed growing it. bigger and bigger so we know that blood. kidney cancer so is especially dependent on angiogenesis on this growth the of blood vessels feed feeding it so we and know in fact, I don't know if you remember from Dr. Lepper's talk, he talked about the number one genomic hit that we see is in the VHL gene. That's a mutation fact, that actually makes Lepper's tumors talk, really oxygen hungry, and they want blood vessels to come the feed them. So that's why that's one of the major targets in kidney cancer is suppressing really the growth of blood vessels, and they suppressing want blood vessels angiogenesis. So and if these drugs are working, we know that in preclinical studies, you actually see less the growth of blood, blood vessels, and the tumors may stabilize or they may start to shrink working, as they lose um, their oxygen and blood less supply. Blood vessels, and the tumors may so how can we quantify angiogenesis better um, than just a ruler measurement with our CT scans? Well, there's a special CT so kit scan called a dynamic perfusion CT, and it's a special a scan that we're set up to do here at Stanford, and we're studying well, if that can really help us measure these angiogenesis factors better. And the things that we're set up to measure to are Stanford tumor blood flow, if that can really help tumor blood volume, and how leaky the blood vessels better. are. The things that we're and it requires very special scanners and software, and we do have this at Stanford. Tumor blood volume and how leaky and, the blood vessels And the hypothesis are. is that and if we're doing an anti-angiogenesis treatment, we should be decreasing and, the tumor blood flow, something that we can't measure with our scanning scans. We should be decreasing the tumor blood volume in your tumors, and we should be decreasing the leakiness of vessels. Scans. We should be decreasing the tumor so blood we do have a clinical trial that offers you this perfusion CT imaging, the and the way it works, and it's for patients that are getting any so of these anti-angiogenesis inhibitors. You this we do a scan before you start your treatment, so we see how vascular it is before you start, and then after one week, we do the we next do scan. Now, this is still research, so no matter what we find at one week, we can't make any clinical decisions. We still have to wait for that 8 to 12 week scan to decide if it's working or not. But what we're hoping to see is a hint. At one week, if we can see we decreased blood flow, decreased tumor volume, and decreased leakiness of vessels, well, what we're hoping to see hopefully that will predict what we, we actually see at 12 weeks with our standard scans and a repeat perfusion CT. Vessels, 
hopeful. So the goal of this study is to determine if blood vessel measurements, not just size, but blood vessel measurements, can change as early as one week. Because we know in preclinical studies, things start to change within days. But right now, a size measurement can't find it. So we want to see if the one-week measurement with the special perfusion scan can predict the 12-week response. So this is very early, but we are offering this participation to any of our patients that are starting these drugs with better angiogenesis inhibitors. So this is very early, and in fact, I think I see a few cases of patients who have actually been on the study. That are starting these drugs with better the, um, it is an additional CT and scan, and it takes an extra 10 minutes for each one of these scans, so you do have to come back at one week and do the, this, um, it is and it's being an run by myself scan, with a radiologist, Dr. Aya Kamaya, and you've so probably you met our study coordinator, Yori, who helps facilitate And it's being run by myself with a radiologist, Well, that's not the only approach. There are and other ways to try and figure this out. Yuri, so some of you have probably had PET scans. PET scan, well, a standard PET scan approach. is when we inject radioactive sugar to try and into you, cells. and so radioactive sugar is taken up by tissues scans. that are very PET active scan, and dividing quickly or metabolically active. Sugar <coughs> and radioactive sugar is taken up by tissues The problem with the regular radioactive sugar PET scan is not all kidney cancers take up the radioactive sugar. So... One of the, the, the um, regular radioactive radiologists sugar at Stanford, Dr. Iagaru, has a new probe. It's called F18 so RGD2 um, peptide. This is a probe that Dr. specifically Iagaru binds blood vessels and it's radioactive. It's so theoretically, what it, he, what it can do peptide. is if we inject this that instead of radioactive sugar, this probe, the RGD2 peptide, so will go what it, what to all the blood vessels, especially the very angiogenic and vascular blood vessels in your tumors, and we can measure, similar to the other study, before starting treatment how much there is vascularity, and, vascular and then after one week of treatment, how that measure. vascularity so has changed based on this radioactive probe. How much there is and then vascularity. there's a third scan that's done after 12 one week weeks treatment, after treatment. How that vascularity and this is an example of the type of data we could get. This is a regular glucose a FDG scan on a patient with lymphoma, because as I said, the regular scans don't necessarily light up in kidney cancer. And all the red spots, the hot spots, that's where there's active tumor based on a glucose scan. So what we're hoping is we can localize your tumor with this all the FDG RGD2 peptide, tumor uh, sorry, the F18 RGD2 so peptide, we can and that we can see a similar picture of your kidney FDG cancer, RGD2 and after we start, peptide, again, these angiogenesis sorry, the inhibitors, peptide, as early as one week, we we're hoping that the red stops cancer. glowing. And after we start so again, we have had patients that have participated both on the perfusion week, CT scan as well as the special PET scan study. So. We have had patients that have Well, how can we do this even more directly? I've just CT talked to you about several well imaging studies, 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 but wouldn't it be much more direct if we could see what's happening in your cells? Well, That's what we want to know. Are the cells dying? Are they growing really fast? Are they slowing down? But wouldn't it be much um, more are they direct depending on the blood vessels? Are there blood vessels? Are there immune cells in your tumor? Are they growing really fast? So what molecules do, if we could even get these cells magically without having to do a big surgery to see what's happening and get a movie, what's happening once we start treatment, what should we even look at? Well, there have been a lot of efforts, and you hear a lot a lot of stuff in the news about measuring changes in DNA, looking at mutations. Also, there's a lot of great well, research going on with RNA. And in fact, I think you're going to hear more in the next talk with Dr. Alshin about ways mutation. we're doing this for DNA. Also, there's a lot of great research well, going on Well, what I'm focusing on are proteins. Because if you think about it, DNA is like a blueprint for building a house. It tells you how things are going to be built. And then RNA is kind of the lumber that everything's made out of. But then it's proteins that are actually the house with the lights on and the lights off. And what we're trying to do with our target therapy is turn the lights off. So it doesn't necessarily get at the blueprint. We want to see if the lights are on or off. And, and that's where the proteins come in. And it's a really hard thing to study, off. and that's so why I've spent so many years here trying to figure this one out. We want to see if the lights are on and the problem off. is, and that's you need a big biopsy to measure it's protein a really hard thing in the tumor, and that's why I've spent so many years here And so serial biopsies, if you wanted to look at one week to see what we're doing at the molecular level in your tumor cells, you'd have to get another surgery to get a big biopsy, and that doesn't make any sense. We're not going to put you through that. So it's just been a big black box. We've simply not been able to look. Well, a solution may be that we can get away with little tiny biopsies. Or so maybe you can get away with cells from your blood if we use super sensitive well, nanotechnologies to analyze tiny numbers of cells. Or maybe you can get away so I'm going to tell you about blood. one specific if nanotechnology that I helped develop to do this in cells, but also put it in the picture of a bigger so thing. I'm tell you about so Stanford, one for the past 15 years, has had a center for nanotechnology excellence. It's run by Dr. Sam Gambier, who's the chair of radiology. And these are some of the projects that are ongoing. I mean, it's actually unbelievable. 
if you it's think about it, you hear Dr. in the news, Sam oh, Gambier, we can inject little tiny nanorobots into your blood. And well, these are imagine the this. Projects that are Dr. Ongoing. Rao's I mean, a chemist here. Actually unbelievable and what he's doing as part of the news, center oh, is he's working on visualizing your tumors by injecting little tiny nanoparticles that go through your blood and get taken up by the tumor. And if you inject just the right cocktail, your tumor can take up these little cocktail things and in the tumor cells, they assemble into something we can image. And not only is he working on having them self-assemble in the cancer cells and only in the cancer cells, once they're done giving off their light, their signal, whether it's a light signal or whatever imaging signal, and we've seen it, then they disassemble and go away. So this is actually something we're working on right now in mice, and it's my job as leader for the clinical translation of the center to start thinking about how is this going to apply to you guys? How can we use this in our patients and link these technologies to our patients in clinical trials? So another project is using nanotechnologies with Dr. Shan Wong and magnets. Magnets are incredibly powerful. We know from MRI. So another that's all based on magnetic technology. But if you can Shannon attach Wong, little magnets, magnets into little magnets nano, nanoparticles, they might be a way to hunt out the cancer cells and show us which cells we need to analyze and get them back out. So, um, so Dr. Wang is using magneto nanotechnology to, answer, to analyze cancer cells and signals in the blood, and I'm partnering with him. So some of you that have donated blood to my um, tumor biomarker study, we're using magneto nanotechnologies to fish cells out of your blood. Blood. Hopefully they're your cancer cells my, and study um, how they're changing early after your treatment. We're using magneto nanotechnology and then this is pretty amazing too. So project three, Dr. Gambier is running it himself. He's using smart nanomark smart nanoparticles and this is to image tumors using sound three, waves. And every Dr. time I've heard him talk about this, he said basically you yell at the tumor and with these nanoparticles, they yell back at you. So now you can say, All right, how are you doing today? And it can say, Oh, I'm growing or it can say, Hey, I'm shrinking, I'm not so hot today. They yell back at you. This is kinda amazing. That it's right, coming. How are you doing today? And it can so say, oh, right now, these three, say, hey, this is the one project two so that's today. actually going on in this our patients. But I'm thinking really hard with the teams one and three so to right figure now, out when and three, how we this can is bring the one project two that's too. actually going on in our patients. But I'm thinking so really one specific nanotechnology that I helped develop is something <laughs> that's now called the Peggy Sue instrument. And I didn't make the instrument, but I figured out how to use it. So one specific nanotechnology. So it allows rapid profiling of proteins. That's now called the Peggy Sue nanotechnology. And I because we make measurements in tiny, tiny capillary tubes. So it allows and we can run 96 tubes at the same time. And it's automated, so the robots do it. So it takes out all tiny, human tiny error because a lot of steps we can and we introduce can error ourselves. At the same time. And we get a result automated, in four so hours. The robots do it, so and what it do we do with this? Human error well, now, because it's a nanotechnology and it only ourselves. takes a little bit of input, and we get a result it's feasible in four to either just get an IR-guided biopsy, so you've all probably well, now, had because um, it's a biopsies done in radiology where they stick a needle in and suck some cells out. Or theoretically, we could start getting cells from blood and you don't have to even poke with a needle. So can we use nanotechnology to measure proteins in tiny numbers of kidney cancer cells? Yes. Determine protein so we signatures of kidney cancer. Probably many of you have participated with me in John Leopard's study, yes. where we're collecting and profiling tumor tissue at the time of surgery from nephrectomy, as well as at the time that our patients are getting radiology-guided biopsies. And so far, we've had more than 200 participants. So thank you all for being a part of this. And the things that we're looking at are, one, the DNA, genomic mutations, but also I'm really passionate about trying to figure out if the lights are on. What proteins are actually at of activated DNA, in your tumor? And then, once we start a treatment, really how they're changing over time? Are we really hitting the what targets that we think we're hitting or not? In your tumor. And so far, and once we start we've been able to sample tumors directly in the tumor, really as well as adjacent non-tumor tissue, or not. and see that the nanotechnologies so give really high definition of proteins and patterns that are different in the tumor versus your own normal definition of So I've talked about trying to analyze the biologic response. And Peggy Sue, this is nanoproteomics, is one approach to measure so and predict response in real time. Wouldn't it be wonderful response. if we could then Sue, either get a sample before you start treatment, either by a radiology biopsy or ideally by blood, and that's the direction time. we're headed. Wouldn't be wonderful and then, then a week later, get, a get another sample and be able at the protein level to see if we've turned the lights off or not. And then a week later, so get I think there's a question earlier about how do we get drug companies interested in this? Because the standard is to get a drug approved right now, we're still using so the size measurements, and that's important. That is our gold how do we standard. Get drug so we'll never get away from that. But we're trying to, to think out of the box right and figure out what other things can we add to that, that to um, make so we'll our um, targets more clear to us. And so, ideally, we can use nanotechnologies to help define protein signatures that predict therapeutic response and tell you. 
and if you're so actually responding in use the cells of interest. To help define protein so we can envision that, that maybe we can do this with a minimally invasive you way. You're actually we use the nanoimmunoassay, the PEGI SU, to profile so changes in cellular pathways in small numbers of tumor cells, way. either by a fine needle aspirate, that IR, the radiology procedure, or from blood, that occur after administering a therapy. A and it is hard to get drug companies to do this because, one, it's a lot of money to do these kinds of studies. And so one approach we've had is we apply for grants and to do it this. Is hard so to we partner for a clinical trial, we get the study drug, and then we build a whole thing of biomarkers around it, and we have managed to get a grant from the Stanford Cancer Institute and also grants and from the NIH we build to fund the things thing that drug companies don't. And that way we have a really great partnership to, to try and figure this out. Because we can figure out which patients early in drug development, which patients really do benefit, we can see if it's the one patient out of 20, that's a drug that would traditionally fail if we couldn't pick out which one it was going to be. But with the right biomarkers in the early development in the early development process, we can find that one patient, that's a drug that might get approved if we know that 9% of those patients respond. So everybody's hunting for these biomarkers. Markers, we can and this is one of our, patient, our efforts to do that. that if we know so that if you've been approached in my clinic or in Sandy's so clinic to participate in our biomarkers and this is one of, our, of uh, our kidney cancer or our investigation so of oncogenes project, in my that just entails two extra tubes of blood and routine visits. And for this, we have enrolled over 100 patients so far. So again, thank you for participating in that. So I'm going to give you one example of how we're doing this in a clinical trial setting. We want to obtain direct tumor measurements when we're so testing a new I'm drug, not just the approved one, that long list that I showed you, setting. but also earlier in the we process. Want to obtain direct and as I said, to develop biomarkers to determine response earlier than 8 to 12 weeks. We want to accelerate the development of new drugs and select early which patients are likely to benefit and help personalize the therapy for patients with advanced disease. So not only predicting based on before you start, but early on figuring out if you're actually responding at a molecular level. And this is really important. In a lot of drug development or clinical trials, if it doesn't shrink the tumors and patients don't live longer, we never know why the really drugs important. fail. We literally have to go back to the drawing board and take just the next best candidate and put it through the pipeline again. Don't well, if we can figure out at the molecular level, you know what? The drug didn't actually get to the cells. That helps us. Then we know to modify the drug so it can get in there. So this is a really important piece that's been missing, but we're really hopeful that we can start answering these questions to really make the whole process much more efficient. So this is a really important piece that's been missing. So the specific example is to analyze changes in tumor cells for a specific drug, CB839. This is is a brand so new first in man drug is which is a glutamate inhibitor. Glutamate, a glutamate is like glucose, it's an alternate, alternate energy this source brand new for tumor cells, and we know that kidney cancer is one of the tumors inhibitor. that tends to rely like on glutamate almost as much, if not more, than glucose. For tumor cells, so we at Stanford have a phase one, two study that that's testing this brand new drug, CB839, a glutamate inhibitor for its ability so to, one, have a be tolerated, one, two and two, to see if it can control drug, tumors. And wouldn't it be great if we can actually measure the protein that CB839 is supposed to be inhibiting? We want to measure the protein that's producing these energy molecules and see if that's changing over time. And then measure if the energy molecules themselves, the glutamate, are actually decreasing over time. So patients that are eligible for the clinical trial are almost any RCC patient who's switching treatment. It's not a first-line study, so you have to have had one thing first. Clinical but if you're considering treatment, Sandy and I are always trying to figure out, okay, well, would this study make sense for you? Study, so you have to and this is run by Dr. Telly at Stanford, and I'm kind of running the RCC arm of the study here. Out, okay, well, and the study coordinator, actually, oh, it's, this should be updated, this is run by Karen Dr. Lau. Telly at Stanford, and I'm kind of running the RCC And the what we built into this is not only the blood test that I told you about using the nanotechnology that I'm working on, but also we've built in a novel imaging and modality to image that pathway of blood interest. Test and this is F18 FSPG, which but also FSPG is, is a glutamate, a glutamate probe. Interest. And this is and, F18 And um, let me show you on the next page what that is. FSPG Interestingly, is so it makes sense. I told you that a regular PET scan and, is actually um, imaging glucose. Well, for this clinical trial, we're trying to change glutamate levels, so it doesn't so make sense to use sense. a standard PET scan. So we're using the FSPG glutamate well, radioactive tracer. Trial, we're trying to change but glutamate that's a very levels, specific so thing, and a a only a handful of patients so across the country are going to get this glutamate, glutamate inhibitor. Could this but particular imaging glutamate radioactive tracer have implications? Well, this is getting back to the whole immunotherapy that we were talking about last hour. Is there a way we can better image response to nivolumab, the PD-1 inhibitor? 
amino well, you know what? We glutamate is also a molecule is that's a used in activated T cells. So we're in, when your immune cell is really revved up and it's doing stuff, well, you know what? they might glow with this tracer. Also a molecule so what we're doing is we're offering so we're in, FSPG when your cell is really imaging and it's doing stuff, to patients that are about to start nivolumab here for kidney cancer, so or this is also is nivolumab is also approved in kidney in lung cancer and melanoma. So those patients are also eligible for this kind of imaging. And this kind of gets that we're going towards molecules. It doesn't necessarily matter what kind of so tumor you have, but if you're getting a therapy that's targeting kind of something imaging. specific, we want to try and make it more cross-disciplinary. So this study, the FSPG have, study, is run by Eric Mitra, and his study coordinators are Sonia and Omar. So I think many of you in the audience have talked so to them study, as well. The and again, this is just the glucose um, image of a glucose scan. But what we hope to see is the hot spots. Actually, if nivolumab, we want to see more hot spots. We want it to get more red, showing that there's immune activation, not decrease in immune activation. We want to see more so to summarize what we I've talked about, more red, we can now use new technologies to measure molecular changes in tumors over time. Everything, almost everything so I talked about is still about. in the research stages, we so we can't use, use any of these studies yet to make a clinical decision. We aren't in every, a position almost where everything we can say, I talked oh, about one week we saw this, stages. so we're going to so switch. But that's what's coming. This is the very first yet step. To make a clinical decision. So we I talked about perfusion CT scan to measure tumor perfusion, the RGD2 blood vessel probe, and the so FSPG immune glutamate probe, perfusion, and how we're making RGD2 nanomeasurements in blood. blood vessel, and they're not mutually exclusive. The you can FSPG participate in several of these at once. I gave you an example how we're and incorporating how we're these technologies in into blood. clinical trials, and they're not including the CB839 study. And you can envision you the an studies that Samit and Sandy are coming up with with the immune trials, combination therapies, how this sort of approach could be really helpful. And we aim to develop biomarkers to help personalize treatment. So with that, I will close and just acknowledge so many people that make this research possible, including our study coordinators. Tommy is here in the back, and he's probably talked to you about drawing tubes of blood. Yori, Shermin, Jared, Denise, as well as our whole clinical team. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a lot of nurse coordinators sitting in the back who are really dedicated to making sure each of us can well get you the care that you need, and you can get all the things we've done. So thank you to everybody, really especially to making sure the patients each of us and the KCA can today. Get you the care that you need, and you can get all the things you need. Done. So thank, you. Awesome. thank you, Alice. Any questions for Dr. Fan? Uh, with the the glutamate <coughs> inhibitor, are can you use those in conjunction with other drugs? Are they being used <coughs> with um, nivolumab and with that's a perfect question. Yes, I didn't go into it, but they were first studying it as a single agent, and there was some activity, but now we're pairing it. So the specific flavors that we have going, we're pairing it with the mTOR Everolimus in RCC, and there's a new amendment to now start pairing it with the, with the um, angiogenesis inhibitors as well. So yes, in fact, they might be most effective in combination. And it is still phase phase, phase one. Phase one, two. It's very Are early. Are you seeing any positive results It's yet? been presented at ASCO this year that we do see in kidney cancer and breast cancer some efficacy. So it's promising. And this may be a whole new thing. There's a lot of excitement about immunotherapy, but we're always thinking about what the next pathway is going to be to target. And metabolic pathway is a big one that's coming. I think this is not the subject of your, uh, but you just kind of addressed this. I wanted to ask, um, I think I read somewhere that cancer cells have a less efficient way of using sugar. Um, is that something that you're, is that what you're talking about metabolically, like try to stop mm -hmm. glycolysis or some other kind exactly. of? Exactly. So um, cancer cells are incredibly smart and resourceful. One, they have very high energy needs. So just the usual ways of getting, of breaking down sugar or making sugar for energy are not necessarily enough. Some patients who have cancers actually have mutations in the sugar Krebs cycle pathway that makes them especially dependent on alternate energy pathways. So studying this balance of energy that's used by tumor cells is, is definitely a hot area of research right now. And being able to target those is something that we're also actively pursuing. So did that answer your question, though? <laughs> no. Yeah? OK. OK. Any other questions? So you mentioned uh, three different areas of nanotechnology treatments. Now, 
if someone's a relatively new patient and doesn't know much about getting on clinical trials, mm -hmm. how does one keep track of what may be taking applicants for trials mm -hmm. and deciding if a certain technology might be appropriate for you? That's a fantastic and question. For that. Yeah. So for RCC, me and Sandy actually are all over everything that we can offer to you. And in fact, my patients are kind of tired of hearing me talk about it in clinic sometimes. So for, for kidney cancer, it, it helps to have somebody that's got a foot in the lab as well as connections to the nanotechnology world. For clinical trials in general, including some of these diagnostic and imaging studies, we do have the Cancer Center website's actually pretty good at Stanford, and all of them are also listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So what I always encourage you know, my friends and patients to do is if there's something that looks interesting to you, bring it to me and I can help you figure it out if it does make sense for you, whether it's worth traveling to Florida to try this new nanotechnology or therapy even, um, or not. The ones closer to home, we definitely are always thinking about each of you. So it's incredible. We never want to stop till we really continue to find mu new drugs, new ways to detect this disease, and new ways to treat this disease. So I think Alice is a great example of how that pursuit continues. So thank you so much, Alice.